Peter Kremlin, live on Sky News Australia. Good evening. Welcome to the show. Here's what's coming up tonight on Credlin. Just days after those horror scenes at a Western Sydney church, some are already downplaying the alleged terror attack. Now, we saw this after the Lynch siege, and it points to a worrying trend to deny reality, even when the authorities themselves have designated this a terror attack. New South Wales police have started rounding up those allegedly involved in confrontations outside the church where Bishop Emmanuel was stabbed. Now, fair enough, people have to protest lawfully, but where are the arrests for the pro-Palestinian protesters who break the law or those anti-Semitic sermons online? Plus, more treaty division. This time, it's at a local council level. The Labor-dominated Cumberland Council trying to push through what's been described as a treaty by stealth with a local Indigenous group. Now, I'll speak with one of the few councillors calling this out a little later. The pressure mounts too for a proper investigation into that record $2.4 million payout to Brittany Higgins. Labor, however, once so eager to yell, cover up, is now desperate to avoid any scrutiny. Now, I've seen media comments that members of the opposition have referred that matter to the NAC, uh, but what the NAC chooses to uh, look into and investigate isn't a matter entirely for the NAC. Was Commonwealth money, was taxpayers' money carefully managed and handled uh, in this instance? I think that is an obvious question to be asking uh, for anybody who reads the uh, very thorough and methodical judgment. But first, whenever there's a terrorist attack in Australia, some claim that it's not really terrorism, and especially that it's got nothing to do with Islam. That's what happened after the Lint Cafe siege, when it was claimed that mental illness was to blame and not extreme Islam, even though the terrorist covered the window with an Islamic flag. And now it's happening again after the knifing of Bishop Emmanuel, even though it's been reported that the English translation of his assailant's words and that he was responding to, quote, an attack on the prophet. Now, unless that translation's wrong and no one's made that claim, that it can be alleged that this 16 year old attacked the bishop because the bishop's words, in his view, were indeed an insult to the prophet. In other words, an Islamic justification for the attack, at least in the mind of the attacker. Now, the bishop was not attacked because of road rage, for instance, or a neighbourhood dispute. What this incident reminds us is that we have people in this country preaching sermons in mosques or radicalising young people online who take very seriously and very literally the Quran's injunction of death to the infidels. We also have a problem that too many of the rest of us keep making excuses for Islam, a religion that needs to purge itself of its extremist wing. As President of Egypt, President al-Sisi, a religious Muslim man, said back in 2015, Islam must not, and I quote, be a source of anxiety, danger, killing and destruction for the rest of the world. Now, if he's stopped making excuses for extreme Islam, it sure should have no apologists here in this country. Yes, the alleged attacker was just 16 years of age. That doesn't make him just a child, as some Muslim leaders have reportedly been saying. And it certainly doesn't mean he could not have had terrorist intent. Indeed, some parts of the media have reported that he was radicalised online. Others insisted he was just a misguided kid, even though he'd earlier been reportedly suspended from his school for carrying a knife. The fact that he was a confused and ignorant youngster doesn't mean that this can't be an act of terrorism. Just as a suicide bombing where it carried out at the behest of a terror group does not become less evil and less terrorist if the killer, and horrifically this has happened on a number of occasions, is a young person or a child. And with the attack had reportedly being praised on social media, here and overseas, 
as is reported today, as a, a very proud Islamic warrior, that we are just fooling ourselves if we do not take this seriously. And look, as I keep saying, ever since October 7, the atrocities and the subsequent breakout of anti-Semitic racism, there's been an obvious double standard in the official response. There's been kid glove treatment for pro-Hamas protesters calling for a new Holocaust with the expulsion of Jews from the river to the sea. And sort of stormtrooper treatment for anyone who might disagree. Like the Jewish man arrested on October 9, the night of infamy at the Sydney Opera House, just because he tried to unfurl an Israeli flag. And it hasn't stopped. Bishop Emmanuel's attacker, well, he still has not been charged. By contrast, riot police turned up today to arrest one of the people outraged at the bishop's knifing. Now, by all means, throw the book of people who break the law, but why favour people protesting in favour of terrorism against people protesting against it? And look, it's no bad thing that the Albanese government is trying to exercise some control over the internet. As long as this doesn't become as one-sided as almost everything else. Yesterday, the East Safety Commissioner ordered Big Tech to take down the footage of the bishop's knifing. But what about all the online anti-Semitic hate speech that preceded it? Today, the Albanese government says it's going to revisit the misinformation and disinformation legislation. It's still a bill in the parliament. It hasn't passed yet. But they want to make it even more selective. Now, I'm all in favour of the internet being purged of the hate preachers radicalising our young people. But as long as the bureaucrats are policing the internet, there's an obvious risk of bias. So far, the online censors have been much better at blacking out truth than falsehoods. It's now overdue that we change the law in this country and declare tech companies to be publishers and broadcasters in the same way that our other media outlets, like this one, are so legislated. And that on this basis, they have to then abide by all the laws, the rules and the codes that govern what we at Sky News can put to air. Otherwise, nothing will change. And if, if you think you can get this internet genie back in the bottle without doing something as big as this, as declaring them responsible for what they allow on their platforms, then you're kidding yourself. Without reform, the internet will remain the Wild West. And we will see more and more, whether it's promoting suicide amongst young people, disseminating horrific child abuse imagery, or radicalising our young, without reform, it will only get worse and more deadly. All right, Olivia Kaysley is on standby in Canberra now with the headlines. Good evening. China's foreign ministry has delivered a sharp rebuke of an increase in Australian defence spending. The Australian government is moving at light speed to respond. The majority will be spent on the AUKUS nuclear submarines program and the purchase of new frigates, missiles and drones. A 4,400 shortfall in uniformed personnel could also be plugged by the recruitment of New Zealanders and Pacific Islanders. Beijing, though, isn't impressed, accusing the government of stoking tensions. We hope that Australia will correctly understand China's development and strategic intentions. China is engaging in the biggest military, conventional military build-up since the end of the Second World War. That is just a fact, and it does change the landscape. The war of words comes as Washington and Beijing tussle for dominance in the Indo-Pacific. The main security risks in the region currently stem from certain external powers outside the region. The Westfield Shopping Centre, where six people were killed in a stabbing attack, has opened its doors for the first time since the incident. The opposition leader paying his respects to the lives lost. I'm honoured to be here today to pay respect to those who have lost their lives. Meanwhile, Bishop Marmory Emmanuel, who was attacked in a separate incident at a Sydney church on Monday night, has publicly forgiven his attacker. I'm doing fine, uh, recovering very quickly, we thank the Lord Jesus. I need you to act Christ-like, 
The Lord Jesus never taught us to fight. Police have arrested a 16-year-old boy over the incident. Five Australians are among 37 people arrested in connection with a global fishing scam. Among the victims were 94,000 Australians who had their personal information, such as online banking logins, credit card details and passwords stolen. Australians who have used this platform to steal data should not expect to remain anonymous. All right, for the rest of the day's big stories, let's bring in media writer for the Australian, Sophie Ellsworth, and Deputy Executive Director of the Institute of Public Affairs, Daniel Wild. He's got some tech issues, but he'll be with us in a moment. I want to start with uh, the attack in Sydney, alleged terror attack, the Western Sydney Church, of course, which left Bishop Emmanuel and a number of parishioners injured. New South Wales police were quick to designate it a terror incident. Now, I think they should, given my view it was ideological in nature. But the Premier today, Chris Minns, was forced to defend that decision amid fears it could raise community tensions. It's not a performative gesture. That designation needed to happen to unlock powers for New South Wales police to investigate this crime. We need to look at radicalisation. We need to look at this young man's history prior to these offences. And, that, and the police commissioner t deemed it necessary to have access to those powers. And that was supported by the Australian Federal Police. It's my judgment that the absolute right decision was made. Now, seriously, Daniel, this is what I saw happen after the Lint siege. There, there was a concerted effort to downplay what Man Harren Monas did to the, the, the hostages he took, uh, the unfurling of an Islamic flag. Back then, too, some of the media tried to say it wasn't terrorism. We should not cop this this week in Sydney either. Well, that's right, Peter. Uh, this is a real test of leadership for the New South Wales Premier and for the Prime Minister uh, as to whether they're going to hold the line uh, and stick to the reality that this was a, a terrorist incident. Uh, it was religiously based or religiously motivated, and that's what Australians are concerned about. Uh, sectarian conflict, racial division uh, has no place in our country. We must be a country based on peace uh, and based on tolerance, it's deeply concerning that there are elements in our society that appear to be radical. Uh, it is now spilling over into the community. Uh, and look, the reality is that um, the New South Wales Premier has to be absolutely strong and forthright on this issue uh, and must assure the people of his state and of Australia uh, that the police and all of the powers that he has will be put to use uh, to dealing with this very critical issue. Now, to his credit, he was today, but he shouldn't have to defend it. And, of course, in the media, Sophie, there's a role there to be played. A few stories around today that the alleged assailant was just a troubled boy, a gentle boy, though, they made that point. He was sort of just disobedient. But, I mean, he has been suspended from school, it's been reported, for knife offences before. Uh, clearly, my view, he's been radicalised in some way into this act of terror. Um, it's no less deadly regardless of the age of the young person, is it? Well, no, it's not, Peter. And, uh, you know, I was watching that vision that went viral very quickly the other night, uh, just couldn't really fathom what we were watching unfold. Uh, and to use descriptions such as a gentle little boy and so forth is really quite hard to come to terms with when you see something as graphic as what was circulating on the internet. So uh, I think the media also has a duty to report this fairly. Of course, uh, we need to let the criminal procedure process play out, but uh, I think they need to be cautious in their descriptions of someone who, you know, has these allegations of criminal offences now uh, against them. Let's go to those chaotic scenes outside the church on Monday night, uh, if we can, Daniel. Um, today we had a 19-year-old. He became the first individual to be charged. Fairly dramatic raid this morning in Sydney. I think there's footage of that up there on the screen. Uh, you know, no issue with arresting anyone who breaks the law, but you can't miss the contrast here between what we've seen today with that arrest so, so soon after Monday night's events and October 7... I mean, no one was being arrested that night other than a poor old Jewish man who tried to unfurl the Israeli flag at the Opera House back on, uh, uh, you know, in the aftermath of those atrocities in October. And every week almost, we've got a gaggle of pro-Palestinian protesters in Victoria, actually. We've got 21 protests, we're told, per week. Many of them relate to Gaza. 
I don't see many arrests coming out of Melbourne either. I haven't seen many. And look, there's an issue here of, of double standards. Those people who were outside the church, who were causing harm or potential damage to paramedics and police, they should be dealt with under the law. Uh, as you say, so should those who were you know, protesting or uh, you know undertaking those activities with pro-Palestinian, pro-Hamas uh, at, at the Sydney Opera House. What Australians expect is the equal enforcement of the law regardless of your race or your religion or your background. And the New South Wales Police or the leadership of New South Wales Police have to be very careful here. Uh, we've seen what can happen. We've seen it in Victoria uh, throughout COVID where there was a double standard. The Black Lives Matter protesters were allowed to go ahead, uh, yet anybody else who was protesting the lockdowns uh, received the full force of the law. We saw people like Zoe Bueller arrested for putting her opinion on social media about the, the lockdowns. And what happened is the trust and confidence in Victoria Police among the community uh, is now at an all-time low because of that double standard. So the New South Wales Police have to be careful to make sure that they enforce the law equally and impartially or trust in them will drop. Talking of double standards, I mean, the whole issue with media platforms, Sophie, X and Facebook, uh, again in the spotlight for the content they allow online, uh, Chris Min said today more comments that he wants to crack down. I agree with this. The Federal Communications Minister, who is squarely responsible, again, I'll say this, the Commonwealth is responsible for the internet. Michelle Rowland, uh, she wants Labor's misinformation, disinformation legislation moved on. Now, fair enough, I want to see this stuff off the internet, not just offensive imagery, but I want the hate preachers gone as well. But this can't be a Trojan horse that the left uses to shut down free speech. Uh, and my fear is that some will be targeted, but others like these hate preachers, which are still there right now, tonight, online, will be let off scot-free. Well, Peter, I think this is a concern because once you start stripping things down from the internet, uh, watch what is the benchmark to do this and what is deemed OK and what is not deemed OK and who are going to be the judges of this. That is also problematic. Uh, that vision, as I spoke about before, that, you know, is circulating on Monday night, I was watching it uh, shortly after. It was absolutely going viral. It was very easy to find something so graphic and very disturbing to watch. Uh, and some of the stuff we see on on the internet today is incredibly dangerous and harmful, but I'm concerned that where will this start and end and what will be stripped down and what will not and will it suit one uh, particular set of beliefs versus others? This is a very uh, a big giant can of worms that is opened and it's going to be difficult to work out how to remove things, what to remove and what not to remove. And I think it's cleaner to treat them like publishers and broadcasters, Sophie, because then they're abiding by all the rules we abide by and they're making decisions before it's posted or what they'll allow then individuals to post rather than be reacting after the event with takedown notices. Let's go to that front page of the Herald Sun today in your, your state of Victoria, Daniel. 560 protests in Melbourne in the past six months alone, 21 a week. That's, that's three a day on average. And what it's meant is a whole lot of police have had to be taken out of uh, suburban areas and country towns and fill the equivalent of 10,000 separate police shifts uh, to, to babysit these left-wing crowds in the city. Predominantly, they are left-wing. Even the case in Melbourne on, uh, on uh, Monday, this A15 pro-Palestinian protest, well, they had to move 550 police into the Melbourne CBD and, again... You know, Melbourne's got a crime wave. They're coming out of the suburbs, home, evasion, home invasions, aggravated burglaries. They're not the focus. It's these protesters. Well, that's right, and good on the police for communicating this problem. I was just mentioning before the, the low confidence that the public has, and this is an important step by the police to do the right thing. The public understands that you have a right to protest and to voice your opinion, of course. Uh, but these are getting out of hand. They're disruptive to living and working in the city. Uh, and these are ratbag protesters. They keep doing it day after day, week after week. And why do they do it? There are no consequences. If you're in Melbourne and you are a protester, the red carpet is 
is rolled out for you. If you want to start a business, well, that's another question. You get drummed out of the city. If you want to drive your car into the city, that's another question. You can't do that. But if you're a protester, come on in. Uh, this is years of failed leadership from the Melbourne City Council who are on the side of the protesters, uh, of the Victorian state government who are on the side of the protesters. The police have said that they want more powers to be able to deal and anticipate with these protests so they don't have to remove their officers uh, from more critical areas. We know that there is a crime problem in Victoria. We know that there is a homelessness problem on the streets of Melbourne. Uh, Ratepayers and residents want those problems fixed and they do not expect, again, this double standard to be applied where you have the red carpet rolled out to you if you're one of these rat bag protesters. Mm. There used to be move-on laws in Victoria, and of course the first thing Daniel Andrews got rid of when he was elected a number of years ago was those move-on powers. Uh, Climate 200, Sophie, they're back in the headlines. They reckon they're going to run 20-odd uh, candidates at the next election. I shouldn't say candidates because they fund others to run, they pretend they're arm's length, but they certainly are sitting there behind all these teal types. 20 seats were told at the federal election, including Peter Dutton's marginal seat of Dixon, I don't know, I reckon now that Scott Morrison's gone, this Teal movement is perhaps not as potent as it was. What do you think? Well, Peter, it's difficult to know. Uh, let's wait and see. But they were definitely potent at the last election. There is no doubt about it. They had a formula that worked and it resonated, uh, you know, with the electorates that they ran in. So I think there'll be a lot of nervous politicians out there if they come up uh, against one of these so-called teal independents because they have a lot of backing behind them, a lot of money behind them, uh, and they had a strategy that worked. But whether it can be successful or not in the next election remains to be seen. Well, it'll be interesting to see. Sophie Daniel, thank you for your time. All right, quick break. After the break, Australia's largest plastics manufacturer has gone bust. What role did their Chinese owners play in this, given it will make us ever more reliant on Beijing for imports? Is that the China long game? Ross Greenwood up next. Plus driverless trucks that might sound like science fiction, but they are already being trialled on freeways in Victoria. Are you ready for it? How safe are they? Coming up. Welcome back. Still to come, another slump in sales for electric vehicles now. Is this just a blip or does it point to much bigger issues for EV take up here and globally? But first, new labour market data out today reveals that the unemployment rate has risen to 3.8% in March, up from 3.7% in February. Joining me now, Sky is business editor Ross Greenwood. Well, we shared uh, 6,500 jobs last month, Ross. We've got a sub 4% employment number. Now, that is still historically low. Let's be, let's be frank about that. But adding record migration, the highest in Australia's history, this is something we've got to watch very closely. And I want to know your assessment with this data out today. How does this feed into the RBA's thinking on a possible rate cut down the track? Well, it's got to sort of push it down the down the track to a certain extent, Peter, because the Reserve Bank, remember, has got two basic mandates. One is to keep inflation under control. Those numbers come out next week and are likely to show again a continuing fall in inflation, which leads to the suggestion the Reserve Bank could cut interest rates. But then the other thing that it's got is it's got to watch the employment markets. And in particular, if there is too much, um, you know, sort of strong news about employment, which this shows today, uh, then the answer is they've probably got to sit tight and allow that in unemployment rate to start to rise before there's an argument to cut the interest rates. Just one little thing I did spot today, though, separate piece of information out today from ASIC, is a number of corporate collapses in Australia in the nine months to the end of March is more than 7,700. So we're on track for the first time in 11 years to have more than 10,000 corporate collapses in a year. That equals job losses. Wow. So you're right to say we need to watch that because because, as I say, if you start to have 10,000 small businesses going broke, that's clearly going to be potentially a lot of job losses coming down the track for Australia. Ross, in that data, do we, do we get a sector-by-sector sector breakout? Because we've seen a, a pretty alarming trend in the building and construction area. Of course, we need them. We need the homes being built. Anything you can tell us there? 
Absolutely, I can. I can tell you that, in fact, there's two sectors that stand out. There is the construction industry, which you rightly cite, but the other one is food and uh, accommodation services. So that means that those two sectors themselves account for 40% of the companies that have gone broke so far this year. So when you start to think about the pressures in those types, it means there's pressure still on mm -hmm. home building. There's not enough homes being built, which squeezes up rents, which squeezes up inflation which squeezes up home prices. So the real pressure that's coming on the supply and demand on homes is not coming off anytime soon, which itself is another reason why the Reserve Bank has got to be cautious about cutting interest rates because that will only fuel a bigger increase in the price of homes. All right, I want to talk about Quenos now because I want everyone at home to understand the significance of what's happened here. They are a major plastics manufacturer for Australia, of course, we've got job losses there. Hundreds of jobs are likely to go. They entered administration today. Their Chinese owners um, sold the business. Now, I make the point that they are Chinese-owned. My concern with that is China owning all of these key assets, and it's not just, obviously, this plastics manufacturer. There are plenty more. It makes us very vulnerable to a decision by the Chinese state through an entity or another company to shut them down and making us then more reliant on Chinese imports. Is that a genuine concern, do you think, here? I think it absolutely is, because who made the decision to allow Chem China to control all of Australia's production of ethylene and polyethylene in the first place? Now, regardless of whether this was a business that was going to collapse anyway or not, it is absolutely vital. Mm. It is strategically vital. So at the same time that the government has got the Future Made in Australia Fund and policy that it's got coming through and handed out $400 million yesterday to a uh, green aluminum a company in Queensland that last year had basically $25,000 worth of revenue. So it's all about hope and not about what's here and now. You've got a company which is strategically important. So think of every pipe, think about everything around you right now that's plastic, comes from ethylene or polyethylene that is made. So it is a failure of industry policy to allow this company to fail and to really strategically mean that we have to rely on overseas supply chains to get that into our country in the future. And you don't imagine that, you know, you sit there and say, well, in, in green electorates or increasingly green electorates such as Botany and also Altona in Victoria, quite clearly many will be cheering the plastics companies and manufacturers are going. But the truth is, when you think about all of our pipes that come from the manufacture of this, this produce um, that, that, that they make, it is absolutely vital for Australia's economy that we really have some self-reliance in this type of material. I am shocked that taxpayers are on the hook for a $400 million loan to a company with booked revenues of $25,000. I mean, one of, the, one of the great concerns I've got is we've only got a handful of steelmakers in this country, a couple, only two smelters, I don't know, two, maybe three refineries. We had the US Ambassador Caroline Kennedy saying, she was telling this to a mining conference, that Australia's battery minerals industry, critical minerals, it's under assault, she says, from Chinese-owned companies. Put it all together, it's pretty concerning. <laughs> Well, you know, the interesting thing that really gets me is we talk about, you know, our self-reliance and we've got a growing population. So the more that our population grows, the more we should be increasingly reliant on our own manufacturing, on our good. But the problem is for any manufacturer, it doesn't matter whether you're making bricks like Brickmakers is or whether you're making polyethylene like Quenos is, the, the cost of energy, the reliable supply of energy, including gas, is absolutely vital to these businesses. The price of labour is going through the roof, although, the, to be honest, they're increasingly mechanised. So these people are now more computer engineers than what they are really brick makers, say, for example. But the reality is, if we don't make those things here in Australia ourselves, and that's where industry policy starts and stops. To say, so, so to see a company like Quinos going broke under these circumstances really beggars belief and raises questions about the failure of government, state and federal, not just on the Labor side, but previous coalition governments as well, clearly have taken their eye mm -hmm. off the ball about the strategic importance of these types of companies. And the cost of energy. Ross Greenwood, thank you very much. Okay. He's good, isn't he? I say that every time.
Now, I was interested to hear this morning, if not a bit concerned, the driverless trucks are set to become commonplace on our roads with a trial launched across two of the busiest truck routes in Victoria today. This morning, Victorian Transport Association CEO Peter Anderson said, well, it's not a far-fetched idea at all. We've already got them in mines, um, 100 tonne tippers hmm. running around driverless in, in mines in, in Western Australia. So, I mean, it does work. The technology's there. It's just the application where we put it and where it's safest and where we'll, the, the community will accept it. There's a big difference between a, a mine and a busy suburban road or a highway. I think uh, he might have a long way to go to convince people. I don't know about that. Think about it at home. Joining me now to discuss it, senior motoring journalist Paul Gover. Well, as I said, no issue uh, at Twiggy's paddocks in the Pilbara, no issue even with a driverless train, Paul. There's, there's a track and it's yep. more or less a straight line. But, I mean, a truck without a driver in amongst a whole lot of other traffic, I mean, a truck's a very big thing in terms of its tonnage weight. What do you think? I think this is something bright and shiny in the news cycle. Um Yes, I can understand why they might be doing some trials to see what's possible. But I can tell you, uh, I think it was about 18 months ago, a driverless truck went all the way across America. And that was touted as being the start of uh, a complete flood of these car uh, trucks onto the roads. So far, zero. Uh, I did a little bit of research today. The only driverless vehicles that are getting any traction overseas are what they call last mile. So delivery trucks that come and bring... Uh, packages to your house, that sort of stuff. There's no large-scale heavy truck uh, infrastructure happening. And the other thing is, I'll bet you when these things are driving around, they won't be driverless. There'll be somebody sitting behind the wheel just in case. Oh, OK. Well, then, just on that point, then, what, what's the advantage? If you're going to have to have a second person in the... or a person, sorry, in the cab anyway, if it's all about saving money, I thought it was about eliminating the drivers. If the drivers are going to be there anyway, why are we doing it? Because we can. Because we're proving that we have technology and aren't we wonderful. But the fact of the matter is, I don't see Lindsay Fox queuing up to take on a whole lot of um, driverless trucks at some time in the future. I think uh, it's like all these things. More than 10 years ago, I was taken for a ride. I was in the driver's seat, but I was taken for a ride in a self-driving BMW. So far, number of production versions of self-driving BMWs, donut. Um, there's a lot of research going on to, into technology that could, maybe would, at some time in the future, come into operation. But really, when you're talking about trucks, the problem is not the truck. The problem is, and not, not even a computer-controlled truck, because that's what we're talking about. They're not driverless, they're computer-controlled, mm. um, is that trucks do what trucks do. People don't do what computers do. And if you look around the world, most of the incidents involving driverless vehicles is where have come when the driverless vehicle assumes that a driver is going to do whatever their, their programming says it should do, and the driver does something different. And that's what the real problem with this is. Um, you know, I've heard talk about high-speed freight trains of cars all driving, you know, millimetres apart on the Hume Highway, all driverless, in inverted commas, because of computer mm. controls and that sort of mm. stuff. But there is no... The, Australia isn't ready for this sort of stuff. Maybe there are a couple of roads which work. And one of the reasons I know this is we're flooded at the moment by Chinese cars. Three new Chinese brands are going to come here again before the end of the year. But the computer uh, driver assistance things, which are basically safety things, stop you drifting out of your lane, putting the brakes on when, in case you're not paying attention, mm. none of them are calibrated for Australia. So they work perfectly well in China where all the roads are state-controlled, there are particular widths, they have the right sort of lane marking, all the signs are the same, all the same height. They come to Australia and they freak out. I had one the other day do a brake test on me at a, in a 100-kilometre-an-hour zone because it saw the 40 zone wow. on the exit ramp and assumed that I was in a 40 zone. I don't know how they're going to read our potholes in, Vic in, in Victoria in particular, but that's another question. Um, electric vehicles, they're, they're falling in terms of sales. Although there's a slight growth, to be fair. There's a slight growth, but it's nothing like the projections. We've got two of the major manufacturers, no. uh, Tesla and the Chinese uh, Build Your Own, I think it's called. They're about to lay off Tesla in the case of 14,000 workers. 
that, that build your dreams. Yep. There you go. The, the sales, as I said, have increased, but only 1.1%. This takes them up to around 8% of market share. A lot of people say, look, the bubble's burst. Is this a slump or are there bigger problems with the take-up of EVs? Oh, there are much bigger problems. And Australia, in our case, it's a little bit like turning up to a party late and realising that all the good-looking people have all be already been uh, take, uh, spoken for. So what's happened is there was an astronomical take-up rate originally because of incentives. In lots of countries, there are huge government incentives of these sort of things. The incentives have come off in Europe and come off in the States and the demand has dropped considerably. Um, the other thing is there are car companies at the moment who are using the profits from their internal combustion cars to fund the development of these electric cars. But I can tell you a lot of brands are now questioning what their future is and how many people are actually going to convert. So uh, I was talking to a, a company yesterday who said that that some of their internal combustion engine models will run longer than they thought they will um, because they're not going to be superseded. Now, there are some companies, Porsche is one, which is going all in on electric. Their best-selling model, the McCann, is only available in electric from the new model coming along. So there are some still committed 100%, but Bentley has wound back their electrification plant. Aston Martin have wound back their production plants. Why is that significant? Because these are niche market companies that don't have big volumes, and so for them to invest a lot of money in in uh, in future programs, they have to be absolutely certain that they're going to be winners, and they're not convinced. And there are more and more companies around the world who are starting to question what their electrification plans are. So I say to my audience, we're all taxpayers. Watch the government start to throw Chris Bowen start to throw a lot of money at this to get what he wants. You into a green car, Paul. Thank you as always. All right, after the brogue, the activists, well, they're still pushing treaties despite your vo voice a vote, but it's not just state governments, it's local councils now in on the act. I'll speak with one councillor pushing back after the break. Plus, the Labor Minister scrambling today to defend the government's multi-million dollar payout to Brittany Higgins. More pressure looming for the anti-corruption watchdog to review it. Welcome back. Coming up, that High Court ruling in the UK that's banned prayer, all prayer, in a prominent school, but Muslim groups are angry. But first, despite the overwhelming rejection of The Voice last year, activists are determined to push on with their Uluru agenda regardless. We've got treaty talks happening in a number of states. The PM is still spending your millions on a treaty commission at a national level. And now a breakout too at local council level. The Cumberland Councils in Western Sydney. And in a meeting last night, the Labor-dominated council tried to ram through what's been described as a treaty by stealth. The treaty-like proposal's been deferred for the time being, but if successful, it would see an agreement forged between the council and a local Aboriginal land group, which could have wide-ranging ramifications. Joining me now to discuss this, one of the few councillors in the Cumberland Shire willing to call this nonsense out. Councillor Steve Christou joins me now. Well, I'm glad it's been deferred, Steve, but that means it hasn't gone away. I mean, deferral means it comes back. Just take my viewers through what's in this draft proposal and why you're so concerned. Peter, thank you. Look, this proposal is absolutely horrendous. It's a comprehensive document prepared by lawyers. It states from the outset is it, it is a treaty um, upon the uh, Uluru Statement. It uh, goes on to say that uh, we acknowledge as a council that the land we're on was never ceded and never handed over to us and we're on stolen land. It further goes on to uh, put procurement measures, employment measures, um, interfere in what kind of contracts we can take place, go out to say, uh, where we can name uh, landscapes, uh, consultations on developments, demands that uh, new namings of places be after Aboriginal people, uh, demands of existing places now have dual names. Like, how much money is this going to cost the ratepayer? Not to mention all the other uh, draconian demands from uh, essentially a group that is 0.64% of the population in Cumberland. About 1,430 Indigenous and 
245,000 people, and this is what we have to put up with. It's very concerning. It was brought to um, council with no briefing to the councillors, no legal representations of whatsoever, and I can't believe had even made the business paper without uh, no consultation or legal briefings to us as councillors. And I will be asking those questions yeah, to the general just... manager. Thank you, Steve. I want to pick up that point, though. I mean, were you blindsided by it? Is that what you're saying? You didn't know that this was even on the cards? Absolutely blindsided by it. The first uh, we found out about it was on Monday evening when I sat down with my council colleagues, um, Councillor Gard and Councillor Hughes, and Councillor Gard said, we should really take a look at what's in that ATSIC um, committee meeting minutes because it is very terrifying. And the more we got into it as a group, the more horrified we were because once we're reading and are trying to comprehend these demands, um, you know, the language around the room is not fit for purpose tonight, but it was like basically around the concept of how the hell did this even make the uh, business paper? How can an ATSIC committee wow. uh, enter to, into this agreement and then want us to tick and flick and give the authority to the general manager to finalise a deal? You are, of course, elected your general manager, you know, the council CEO is not. Your local council area, they voted 64% no. They were against the voice at last year's referendum. What do you think your ratepayers rate would think of this? Our ratepayers are absolutely disgusted. I've been inundated uh, with calls today from people uh, saying, well done for standing up against this. We voted no. We're more concerned on how we're going to pay the mortgage, the rent, the bills and put food on the table to feed the children. We want upgrades to roads, upgrades to footpaths, upgrades to libraries and public parks, not this kind of garbage trying to force feed us what we um, ideologies down our throats. That's what the ratepayers are saying. The ratepayers are disgusted. They've suffered immensely the last three years through cost of living crisis. They've had their council rates increased. They've had um, photocopying mm. fees to students increase, council-owned asset uh, Price increases increased, building application fees for mums and dads trying to build their first family home have doubled. Uh, small businesses that have been subjected to a uh, health inspection, their fees have doubled. It's absolutely not on and they expect a lot better from a Labor majority rather than trying to push in ideologies like this. Steve, stay in touch. I want to come back to this and see what happens from here on in. As I said, I know it's deferred. It hasn't gone away, but good on you for standing up for your ratepayers. Steve Christou there Thanks. from the Cumberland Shire Council in Sydney. After the break, mean girl Katie Gallagher under pressure to defend that multi-million dollar payout to Brittany Higgins. Plus, is Anthony Albanese simply paying politics with our visa system? More on that after the break. Welcome back. Let's bring in my panel now. Shadow Environment Minister Jonathan Dunham and Pauline Hanson's Chief of Staff James Ashby. Well, welcome to you both. Uh, if I can, James Ashby, I'll, I'll just start with that, that fascinating interview from the councillor there in Western Sydney, the Cumberland Shire. Mm. It landed on the, the desk of the council to sort of tick and flick basically a treaty by stealth, you know, a, a Indigenous favoured procurement, Indigenous hiring. Uh, the, the dual naming of a whole lot of stuff in that council area. I mean, this was a part of Sydney that voted 64% against The Voice. What's going on? Yeah, well done to Steve. I must say, um, I'd love more people like him to put their hand up for state and federal parliament as well, because we need people like this to call things out. Uh, local government, local council have no right to enter into this type of politics. At the end of the day, council are there to service roads, uh, roads rates and rubbish and they are well, going well mm. and truly beyond the scope of what council should be doing. Uh, look, as far as I'm concerned, native title is extinguished right across the majority of Sydney. There is no reason to bring in Indigenous people to any of the decisions um, in council because they're unelected members. Steve is an elected member. He should have the final say. And, and yeah, look, for them to land this, uh, this motion or however they run things in council, at last minute, without any advice being given by lawyers within council, it is ridiculous. He's right to call it out. And well done to him. Dono, I've said from the outset this this payment to Brittany Higgins, two point four million dollars. You know, I've been involved in staffing in Canberra for a long time, as have you. I mean, it stinks. 
it absolutely stinks. I've seen nothing like it in terms of quantum, uh, time, uh, standing down of the employers, not allowing them to give evidence. Uh, clearly, once the grounds of the cover-up claim were dismissed uh, by Justice Lee on Monday, there was no cover-up, he said, then that was the basis for the, for the quantum, you know, the great scale of that payment, then surely the payment now must be questioned. Labor were on the ropes about this today. If this new watchdog doesn't look into this payment, then there's no point to it. Yeah, that, that's right. I mean, how else do the people of Australia that fund payments like the one we're talking about here, and indeed their representatives in Parliament get answers to these questions? That's what the NAC was set up for, to investigate these matters. And I think it is absolutely essential that we do get clear answers on how they determined the quantum, why it happened in uh, record-setting time, and, of course, this unusual step where certain parties were excluded from proceedings. It does smell, I have to say. The, the entire set of events, mm. frankly, do. Uh, but you know, uh, this is the risk with uh, entities like the NAC that the uh, Labor government was so keen to set up. It can and should look into anything, and I certainly hope that we do see this one uh, exercising its powers with regard to this particular payment and decision. Um, James, the PM today has confirmed the government will consider a visa extension for the Pakistani security guard who was injured uh, in the Bondi attack on Saturday. Now, this is after a similar visa extension had been offered to, to the Bollard man, the Frenchman. Um, OK, the Bollard man, the security man, the Bill of Wheeler family, the PM made that decision there yeah. as well, basically off the cup. Um, I have no issue with the first two, right? Right, They've gone out of their way to defend Australians uh, and they did it without hesitation. However, I am uneasy about the, the politics of the PM using visas and its allocation of visas in this country, some sort of PR stunt, if they should stay yeah. here, then surely we've got to have a proper process. 100% right. This bloke thinks he's Oprah Winfrey giving away cars, but instead he's giving away permanent residency and Australian citizenship. Uh, look, it was lower hanging fruit for him to go out and sort of make this announcement he'd give the French national uh, citizenship, but I don't think the French bloke was actually searching for it. Now, I also recall him saying that uh, he doesn't want to take heroes away from the French. Well, I don't want to take heroes away from the Pakistanis either. As far as I'm concerned, there's due process. It should be followed. If you don't meet the threshold, back on the boat, back on the plane, wherever, whichever way you came here, off you go, because there must be a orderly process. Otherwise, we've got people that will claim they're doing heroic jobs right across this country just to simply get their way into, the, uh, into Australia. No, it's not on. What about this High Court case in the UK? It's a huge one, Jono. Um, a Muslim student challenged a school. A school said, we've got no prayers in this school. You don't like it, go somewhere else. Uh, the court upheld that view. There are no prayers at the school, but the Muslim groups in the UK aren't happy. Yeah, it, can I say it's rather an interesting set of developments. I mean, uh, you consider what's happening here in Australia at the moment with the Australian Law Reform Commission's report around how religious schools might be able to operate. I mean, the state are willing to, here in Australia, wade into the function and operation of faith-based schools and are considering uh, banning the ability for schools to hire and fire on the basis of whether people share their beliefs and perhaps interfere in what sort of students they bring in. Uh, but, uh, yep. you know, don't like it when faith-based groups would like to uh, insist on uh, perhaps prayer and Choice. other observations. John, I've got to leave it there. No worries. I'm eating into Andrew Bolt's time, but it's all about choice. Thank you both, Jono and James. That's it for me. See you Monday. Here's Andrew.